Hi, everybody. I'm Natalie Brunel. And thanks so much for checking out my show where I get to hear from the leading voices in Bitcoin, financial markets, political structures, philosophy, and more. Please make sure that you subscribe to my page and like this video so more people see it and so that you don't miss out on any new content. This podcast does not provide financial advice. It is for entertainment and educational purposes only. This show wouldn't be possible without support from my sponsors, First and foremost, Swan Bitcoin. Swan is where I do all of my Bitcoin purchases and I dollar cost average every single day with the lowest fees in the space. And I love Swan because it's a Bitcoin only company. Swan Studios produces my new show, Hard Money, covering the biggest news in Bitcoin and the global economy. It's like an orange pilled version of CNBC. So make sure to check that out on YouTube for all the biggest headlines because we are not afraid to question the mainstream narrative. And Swan is putting on the first and biggest West Coast Bitcoin-only conference, Pacific Bitcoin. It'll be held November 10th and 11th in the LA area with prominent speakers like Lynn Alden and Preston Pish. I'm very excited to be the MC for the event alongside Peter McCormick and Stefan Lavera. So if you want to get your ticket with 20% off, use the code HODL at PacificBitcoin.com. All right, it's time for the show. All right. Well, Luke, thank you so much for joining me. You are a very uh, requested guest and I really appreciate Preston Pish making the introduction. So thanks for coming on Coin Stories. Thanks for having me on, Natalie. It's great to be here. I want to start out with a little bit of your background because I read your bio, but um, I don't know a lot about where you came from and how you started your company. So I'm assuming you're from Ohio since that's where you live and went to college. I am. I'm uh, Ohio born and raised. I uh, was uh, going to be an architect, uh, actually. Um, uh, so I, I was able to get into the University of Cincinnati, which was for the architecture school, one of the top five schools in the country for architecture when uh, when I applied and got in. And I got about a quarter and a half into that and realized I was not going to be an architect. So <laughs> it was simply not my I kept asking who's going to pay for this stuff. So uh, I figured my background might be in in more in finance and, and, and investment. So uh, graduated degree in finance and accounting uh, from the University of Cincinnati uh, and then uh, began working on the sell side, investment research sell side uh, uh, at a uh, old line Cleveland money management firm called Ralston and Company uh, in, two, in 1996. This is going way back. 1996, um, there was a group of people that left and uh, formed an investment research firm called Midwest Research. Uh, I think there were eight, eight, uh, eight guys, a couple other folks. I was the young guy literally sitting on the floor licking envelopes to send out to clients to tell them that we had started this new firm or that they had started the new firm. I was just glomming on. Uh, at any rate, uh, it took off. We were early pioneers in bottoms up fundamental channel check research. Um, the business took off. Uh, uh, it was it was made a partner there. Uh, we sold that business to First Tennessee Bank out of Memphis in 2001, wow. if I remember right. Worked with FTN Midwest. Uh, uh, started in investment research. Transitioned over to institutional equity sales, calling on different accounts in uh, New York, California, Texas, Kansas City, um, uh, Missouri. Uh, around the country, really. Um, and in uh, 2006, myself and a group of about 20 other people left Midwest, formed a, an investment research firm called Cleveland Research Company. Uh, at both Midwest uh, in the late 90s, I was one of the founding editors of a piece that was called The Herd in the Midwest, which was a uh, we were doing this this real groundbreaking bottoms up fundamental channel check work that really no one was doing at the time. Everyone does it now, but nobody was doing it at the time. Uh, and I and my, myself and another uh, colleague of mine started putting together this Friday piece that basically connected dots and married uh, the bottoms up fundamentals with top down work I was doing on my own. Um, and, and it tended to end up being a thematic slash macro piece. Love doing it. Extremely widely read uh, across Wall Street. Reprise that role at Cleveland Research Company. Uh, into the 2008 timeframe, uh, we were able to help clients that we called on uh, for the firm uh, get through what happened in 08 and 09 pretty well. Uh, post 09, spending a lot more of my time doing macro thematic work as the world became much more macro and Fed and central bank driven. 2003 or 2014, I decided I wanted to do more of that uh, full time. Went to my partners and said, "Hey, I want to wear a macro hat full time." They said, "You know." They, they, they said, makes sense. I said, you know what? My one key caveat is I want to have complete creative control to write whatever I want to write, because I just felt like 
as I looked out beyond sort of just what might be over the horizon, it seemed to me having the creative freedom to say whatever I wanted to say uh, might be increasingly important. And as it turns out, uh, that was that it's absolutely been the case. Uh, we ended up parting ways amicably. Uh, I, I still talk to a number of my partners over there, former partners over there. Great bunch of guys doing great work. Uh, so I hung on my own shingle as FFTT, which stands for Forest for the Trees in early 14. We didn't take any outside investor money because, again, I wanted to have complete creative control to write whatever uh, I wanted to write because I felt like that was going to be important. And so we've got this great independence um, uh, by virtue of that. Uh, and uh, that's that's the, the nickel tour of my background. I mean, that was a uh, coin stories all wrapped up. And I think just two minutes or so. That was amazing. Um, just to dig in a little bit more, is there something from your background, maybe your young life that made you curious about economics and, you know, sort of started you in this direction and made you really passionate about it where you ultimately said no to architecture and yes to this? Um, when I started in architecture, it was pretty clear early on. I just didn't uh, it just wasn't where my passion was. Uh, I have a, one of my best friends. He's 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 an unbelievable architect, and he was he he was just running circles around me in architecture. And ironically, we took a couple economics courses, and he he beat me in those too, which was really frustrating. He's brilliant, yeah. So uh, at any rate. I knew I didn't want to do architecture and I'd love to say there was some big aha moment. The aha moment for me was I walked by a sign uh, in, in one of the uh, I don't know, buildings at the university of Cincinnati circa 1994 or three. And it was an AT&T investment challenge where you got to manage a mock portfolio. And wow. I looked at that and I just said, that sounds really interesting to me. I want to learn more about that. And so I started taking some accounting and finance courses and it was, that was, that was, those were my people, so to speak. I enjoyed the classwork. I enjoyed learning. I did a co-op. Uh, Cincinnati has a, a great co-op program where you can go to school back there as like every quarter, every other quarter, go to school, work, go to school, work. And so you get to actually go into your field as a college sophomore and see what it's really like, not just theoretical. And um, like I said, I started co-oping with Ralston and Company uh, in Cleveland at the time, and it was just—I knew right then I was hooked. I—I I, I want you know, I'd go and I'd sit with the traders. I'd have—I'd have lunch with the sales guys. I got to go on research trips and go see companies, go see CEOs as a twenty-year-old at the time. Um, and I just knew it was what I wanted to do. So it uh, that was that was those were really sort of the the uh, the two aha moments was that just kind of seeing that that sounded interesting, and then actually having that real world experience so early in my college career uh, really cemented it for me that that's what I wanted to do. Well, you've seen a lot of business cycles and economic cycles over your experience. Can you talk a little bit about what lessons you you've pulled that really informs your your research today? Because we've I feel, feel like we just go through this series of bubbles, right? And we had a housing bubble. We had well, we had the dot com bubble, then the housing bubble. Now it's a treasury bubble. It feels like an everything bubble, right? So, can you talk a little bit about what your experience has taught you in terms of history and where it's where it's telling us we're going? Yeah. That's 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 a big question. Um, it there's a lot of things I've learned. So one of the things I've learned by virtue of being in Ohio and doing this is we're sort of I, I like to call Ohio like my favorite emerging market, right? It, it's <laughs> and and by virtue of that, you know, people always say, well, when when the when the cycle turns, the emerging markets see it first, right? They see the dollar liquidity recede first. We've always seen it recede first here. And it was a huge advantage for us because we'd be here talking to industrial companies, heavy duty truck dealers, and we're seeing things slow down. And we'd call our clients in New York or on the coasts or in, you know, in Europe and go, hey, it's really slowing. And they go, what are you talking about? Nothing's slowing. And because they were the center of liquidity, they didn't see it till the very end. Now, the flip side was is once the cycle bottomed out, they would see it first because it would be a turn in liquidity. And we would still be saying, well, no, we're talking to the truck dealers and we're talking to the distributors, industrial distributors, and we're talking to different retail distributors, et cetera. They're not seeing it yet, but they would soon see it shortly thereafter, right? So there's, for one of the things we've learned, I've learned by virtue of being here in the industrial Midwest, uh, the Rust Belt for for the, the entirety of my career is, I think first off, seeing uh, multiple times that we see the liquidity recede first and we see the liquidity come back 
last or on a lag, maybe not last, but certainly on a lag. Um, I think in terms of more sort of meta uh, or bigger picture view than that, um, this the cycles do, they have had this sort of, um, I don't know, similar rhythm to them, right? In terms of the psychology, in terms of um, where, you know, I think you framed it up really well, is we had this equity bubble, we, they burst, we kicked it upstairs to the banking sector by creating a housing bubble, it burst, they kicked it upstairs to the sovereign uh, debt level yeah. by virtue of the backstops. And now um, the psychology around each iteration is really interesting because you can see the bubble, like the definition of, a, in my view, uh, a bubble is the asset where nobody believes it can burst, right? It was, hey, it's it's different this time. And so with, with I remember the dot-com and that was early in my career. And, and I just remember, you know, this is 1999 and I'm just pounding the phones, trying to make a live. And I mean, my, I was on straight commission for pretty much my entire career, right? So um, I was making whatever is making base, but it was, it was all commission. And so I remember my first month on straight commission, early 99, I literally made $40 in the whole month, whole month. Wow. Um, which keeps you hungry. Um, <laughs> but I was, I knew it was going to work out well because it was a, I had a great product, a great bunch of people. Um, and, and we were gaining a ton of market share. But the point is, is in 99, by mid 99, end of 99, I'm just pounding phones all day, right? I'm still hungry for making 40 bucks in, in a month in January. And and I'm making a little more than 40 bucks a month now, thank God. Uh, but I'm looking over at sort of like the summer interns who were working for us that summer. And they were making like 10 grand a month trading internet stocks. Like it was unbelievable. Like day trading stuff. They were, <laughs> wow. and they're high five. And I'm over here making 80 calls a day, just pounding phones. And they're doing, you know, day trading for a couple hours and then going out to going out to the yeah. bar all afternoon with their winnings. And so you see these sort of things that are like that, that that doesn't seem sustainable to me. But at the time, you're kind of like, OK, maybe it is different. But then you start to, you know, in hindsight, after my first cycle, like, OK, I remember that now. Right. And so mm -hmm. you fast forward to the 05, 06. Right. Yeah. Everybody's getting rich in housing. It's, yeah. it, it's like, wait. I remember this. And yeah. so you start to see the sentiment again. And and we had it with the GameStop and crypto, like the meme stocks and all that. It went too. crazy. Yeah. That's exactly right. It was, hey, it was yeah. so easy to get rid. It was, I mean, um, exactly. It's that same sort of feeling. Um, and, a, and a little bit now, you know, when you talk about what's what's the bubble, it's it really is. It's it's sovereign debt. It's it's the dollar. It's the cent right. It's just the high fiving of the you know. Hey, that the, the, there was literally an article on Bloomberg last week. Nothing can make the dollar go down, and and nominally they're right. But there was nothing that can make internet stocks go down. There was nothing that can make housing go down. There was not like it was. So a bubble is always this really really like airtight story. Um, why it's different this time. And, you know, you just have to look for some of those sentiment things, I think, ultimately, is one is one of the big things I've learned is that some of it is just feel almost it. You can almost see the repeat in psychology cycle over cycle. Yeah, well, it's interesting to see, just like you said, I mean, history sort of repeat itself. But at the same time, it seems like we're really in unprecedented times um, because of the the record levels of inflation at the same time as debt and what's happening on a on a geopolitical stage where other countries are basically saying, hey, you know what, we're we're going to go off the dollar standard, perhaps in, in, in the coming months or years. So can you talk a little bit about where we're at right now? Um, we are waiting for the next CPI print. So by the time this interview comes out, we might have it. Uh, obviously, the Fed says that they're they're willing to pretty much do anything in order to bring that down. Like I mentioned, record levels of debt, so you can't sky hot, um, skyrocket rates the way that Volcker did in the 80s. Um, so where are we at and how much power are countries like Russia and China now grabbing onto? That, that's it's I think ultimately. Um, one of the big questions of today. Right. So, I mean, there was a big debate last week on Bloomberg, right, between Perry Merling and Zoltan Pozar about, hey, what's what's, you know, Bretton Woods three? Is it viable? Is it not? Um, I think that 
ultimately um, you're seeing energy markets being de-dollarized as we speak. And I think that's ultimately what Putin is trying to do. He's been talking about it for mm -hmm. eight, 10 years. Basically, the dollar's monopoly in energy markets is a problem. And he said it over and over. Um, and you can find him saying it over and over going back a decade. Yeah, he calls um, he calls it a parasite on the global <laughs> economy. Yeah, the dollar. Yeah, he call and, and and I think for him it's it's really about the energy markets, right? And so I think all he's trying to do is de-dollarize energy markets, um, which is to say, buy it from me in ruble, yen, yuan, um, and and clearly you are seeing a measure of de-dollarization of the energy markets. Uh, we just saw the headline last week um, that that deals between Gazprom and China are now being done in in ruble and yuan. Um, uh, you've seen the Indians buying uh, on the margin. Again, it's all on the margin and people will say, well, it's not that much. But I remember traveling 10 years ago and 15 years ago with the CFO, one of the biggest grains or one of the biggest commodity traders in the world. Um, and he, he kept saying something repeatedly in meetings, which was in, in, in commodity markets, the marginal ton prices the whole. And that's exactly right, right? There was no home for the for marginal barrel of oil last last April, and so it went to negative thirty seven to pay somebody to take it off their hands. The marginal barrel priced the whole. Same thing in commodity markets. So it's you don't need people think oh de dollarization they're going to get rid of the dollar and everything's be pricing you want. No, but the marginal barrel of oil, the marginal gas, marginal ton of iron ore is factually being priced in Chinese yuan. That starts to have important implications for the uh, marginal pricing of the commodity, marginal pricing in dollar terms, the margin, the the cross rate dollar yuan cross rate, China's ability to manage that based on how they bring flows of that commodity in and out, it just really starts to change the game in a big way. And I think ultimately that's what Putin is trying to do is just give himself the greater flexibility of I want I want to be able to sell in dollars, yen, yuan, basically based on the things I need. And that way, the dollar can't be fully weaponized against me, uh, as we've seen it weaponized against him and others repeatedly. Um, and so I, I think we are seeing a steady march toward the de-dollarization of commodities. People say, look, oh, what is what are they going to what are they going to price? And instead, it's this nothing is going to replace the dollar. That's whether well, there's no alternative. And I hear that a lot from FX traders, right, guys that just trade currencies. I get it. Nothing is going to replace the dollar in the currency world. But when it touches the physical world is where we're seeing that change. When, we're, when it touches the commodity world, we're seeing that change, which is to say the system is transitioning towards price in multiple currencies, settle in goods with any net amount in gold. And that has important implications as they keep moving or you know, to the extent that Look, I think what the West would like to do is depose Putin, get him thrown out, um, get rid of Xi, get him thrown out, um, basically put another Yeltsin back in so Western companies can go back to basically buying up Russian assets on the cheap, selling it all in dollars. That's where I think the goal here is. Uh, and I think Ukraine is a means to that end. We'll see how it plays out. But that's what I think the underlying situation is here as it relates to you know, where the dollar is, what the dollar's role in the future is, and commodity markets, how how de-dollarization is doing, how it's not doing, et cetera. Well, can you crystallize that a little bit more just in terms of where you see the dollar going in the next 10, 20 years, being that it is the reserve currency right now? And a lot of people, a lot of my listeners who are big proponents of Bitcoin, they see that as potentially, um, you know, nations moving toward a global neutral reserve currency. But at the same time, I, you know, China has its own CBDC. Uh, Russia has come out against Bitcoin. And then they've like kind of, kind of teetered back and forth. They have said at one point that they perhaps might even accept uh, oil payments in, in Bitcoin. So I think we're a little bit all over the place. But, you know, 10, 20 years out, is the dollar still the global reserve currency? <laughs> I think you have to separate it into reserve currency and reserve asset, primary reserve asset. Mm -hmm. I think the dollar will still be a reserve currency, if not the primary reserve currency. Uh, as a payment rail. yeah. As a payment rail, right? Okay. In the same way, English is still the primary mm -hmm. spoken language as a network effect, et cetera. I think there's very little chance that the treasury bond is still the primary reserve asset in 10 years or 20 years. And I think some sort of neutral reserve asset has to take place, will take its place, is taking its place. I mean, 
de facto gold. it's already happening. Gold is 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 in the, you look at the last nine years, mm-hmm. global central banks have net sold, I think, 60 billion in treasuries and they've bought over a quarter trillion dollars worth of gold. Uh, and people say, so what? It's only a quarter trillion dollars. And you say, so what? Until they revalue it because central banks have a printing press. They can revalue it whenever they want. Uh, in theory, um, you can turn, you know, 250 billion into two and a half trillion in a big hurry, for example. Um, so uh, it's just a matter of, of central banks, enough of them getting together and revaluing it with a couple oil producers. So I think the dollar's reserve status will continue. I think the pr- Treasury's primary reserve status is already on the way out, mm-hmm. out of necessity. And some of this is driven by um, a desire to um, hurt elements in Washington. But I think it is more out of weakness, really, that China is pushing this, uh, that Russia is pushing this. They have to because they can't. Russia can't keep selling oil that goes up 8 percent a year. Um for treasury, you know, the, for treasuries, you actually heard this. You, you in Putin's speech in June said we, FX reserves decline at eight percent per year. Where do you get that number from? U.S. federal debt has grown eight percent kager every year. And I tweeted about this last week. I said, look, uh, if 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 you think if if you think this is a good deal that that you that 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 Russia takes treasuries as payment as settlement payment for oil. When the debt's growing 8% and the coupon on the treasuries hasn't been over two in forever, like call me, I'll borrow a billion from you at, you know, I'll, I'll borrow 8% more every year at 2%. And people are like, well, how are you going to pay me back? I'm like, It's a Ponzi. I'll pay you back out of what you give me the next year. And then I'll keep the difference and I'll just keep doing it. So yeah. um, there is this, you know, primary reserve or primary reserve asset, primary reserve uh, currency. I think the dollar is fine. I think the reserve asset is on the way out already. Uh, you're seeing that system shift. It's out of necessity from nations like Russia and China in particular. Um, and so I think that is, now, what does the dollar do? What does this mean for the dollar? Here too, I think there's two things. With what is happening right now, There's it's really a binary thing. Is the Fed monetizing enough US deficits or are they not? When they aren't, the dollar is going to go up. And the dollar goes up and it's going to go up until stuff breaks. And then it will go up even faster. Mm-hmm. And, and in theory, the dollar could be at 500 on the Dixie and we'll all be standing in line at a gas station wondering why our dollars don't buy us gasoline, why there's no gasoline in the pumps. That's sort of the natural terminus of all of this because it will break global supply chains. Mm-hmm. Um, so as long as the Fed's not buying enough treasuries, monetizing enough debt, the dollar's going to go up. Ultimately, the government's very short dollars, so they have to eventually come in and monetize that. And that's where we get into your point, you know, where we are now, which is you're seeing strength in the system. You're seeing the economy weakening. It's very weak elsewhere, but ele- but inflation is still elevated. And this is just a classic emerging market problem, which is, listen, if they want to stop, if they really want to stop inflation, they do have to break everything. But with debt where it is, you're going to be talking about yeah. sovereigns defaulting on their debt. And they can't they can't afford that either. So 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 you're seeing uh, government central banks stuck uh, between a rock and a hard place in a way uh, that I don't think they've seen since the immediate aftermath of World War One. Um, and at a scale that, as far as I'm aware of, has never happened before in terms of the amount of debt, the amount of derivatives, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, that kind of speaks to your recent tweet. You said Powell's paradox, U.S. federal fiscal policy is only sustainable if inflation remains high. A Fed victory against inflation will force a U.S. government default on entitlements and our U.S. treasuries or a U.S. government defeat in the new Cold War. Can you kind of expand a little bit on that? Yeah, it's it's really straightforward. You, you Reinhardt and Rogoff, did, who are two of the foremost experts uh, on global sovereign debt, and global sovereign debt bubbles. Uh, Reinhardt, I believe, is now the president of the World Bank. Uh, Rogoff was the chief economist of the IMF. Um, they highlighted that, and this is via um, Hirschman Capital, uh, that over the last 220 years, every nation that had 130% debt to GDP, 98% of them defaulted on their debt. Almost all of them via a sustained period of high inflation to basically decrease, increase GDP nominally, decrease the debt Basically, bondholders lost. Uh, we saw this in the United States after World War II, where debt to GDP was 110 percent. 
we saw U.S. real interest rates go to negative 14 percent. So inflation was 16 percent. The Fed capped yields at two and bondholders lost money on a real basis. Debt to GDP went from 110 to 55 percent in just five years. Thank you for your donation, Treasury holders. The U.S. is back on its feet. And away we go. Right. Mm -hmm. This has happened over and over and over. Now, there were a few hyperinflations and there were a few restructurings or def nominal defaults, but that's not likely what's going to happen. And so you can go back to 2021 where um, we saw nominal GDP in the United States ran 11 and a half percent. CPI ran 8 percent and debt to GDP in the United States went from 129 percent to 122 percent. It we we delevered. Uh, at the time, I thought they were going to continue to do that. They literally laid that playbook out in August of 2019. Uh, Stan Fisher, two other former central bankers, said, "Hey, in the next crisis, we're going to have to cap yields, print money, inflate away the debt." So far, so good. Politically, inflation began to be a problem. Um, our view all along has been that you've got to inflate the debt to GDP back to 70 to 80 percent in the United States. Uh, or else if you try to tighten beforehand, it's going to be a disaster. And politics being politics in an election year, they tried tightening beforehand. Fast forward eight months, we've got 60-40 portfolio, which, you know, 60% stocks, 40% bonds. It is a disaster. It is the worst year uh, mm -hmm. in 50 years of data. Uh, we don't, you know, I don't even know, but data going back 50 years, it's the worst year for the 60-40 portfolio. Um, the economy is soft, et cetera. Um, so you've seen it not working. Where we get to with when I that tweet specifically is if you look at and, and the reason why I thought it would be a disaster if they tried to tighten too soon uh, would be was was if you look at the what we call the U.S. government's big three expenditures, it's Treasury spending, uh, it's entitlements, it's defense. Uh, those three were after COVID 140 percent of tax receipts, uh, even with the inflation and and uh, in nominal GDP growth we saw in 2021. It took that 11 percent nominal GDP growth, 8 percent CPI to get what we call true interest expense, which is just entitlement pay goes plus Treasury spending below tax receipts. Right. So basically you were seeing the U.S.'s effective interest expense above tax receipts until they inflated the way they did. They got it back below. Great. Keep doing it. Then you stop, reverse course. So the point of that tweet is that basically Powell needs this inflation. He needs to get this true interest expense further back below um, uh, further back below uh, tax receipts so that basically the U.S. government isn't crowding out uh, global dollar markets, sending the dollar higher and higher and and breaking things, for lack of a better word. Uh, but that's not what they're doing. They're doing the exact opposite. Well, I heard you say on a recent podcast that you expect next year inflation rates to be in the double digits. So how do we get there? And what does that mean for everything from equities to the housing market to Bitcoin and bonds? I think we're going to see uh, I think we've seen the local high. I think the local high in CPI was July, whatever that print was, right? Nine or whatever. Uh, but I think people are going to be surprised how quickly things come unhinged between what the Fed's already done, but more importantly, what we're seeing in energy in Europe uh, in Japan. Um, I think we're going to see the global economy really come unhinged. And when that happens, uh, and I think it's a when, and I think it's pretty soon, uh, the Fed's going to be forced to reverse course uh, to preserve the system. But basically, they're going; their choice is going to be uh, either stand aside and let the whole thing burn to the ground, deflationary or, bust on a grand scale, yeah, on a grand scale, on a grand scale, mm -hmm. up to and including Western sovereigns defaulting on their debt. Uh, mm -hmm. And yes, the United States would go last, but it, it would go if the Fed doesn't get in there. Uh, and so the, then. You're going to be faced with a situation where the Fed's going to have to begin, you know, stop with QT, stop with the interest rate hikes, cut interest rates, start regrowing their balance sheet with CPI still probably four, five, six. And that's why I think by this time next year, I think it's very possible, if not likely, that we'll see CPI back into the double digits because it's just – they didn't let debt to GDP go further, far enough down, get inflated away enough um, 
uh, to not create a disaster. And this is before all the geopolitical stuff. It was going to be a disaster no matter what. You know, Putin would just threw a spanner in the works with what's happened and then the reactions to all of these things. Mm-hmm. Well, what are they what's the political narrative going to blame that type of inflation on? Because right now they have some scapegoats. They always find a scapegoat. Right. But I mean, double digit inflation hitting the average hardworking American. How how is that going to be portrayed? Oh, it's going to be interesting. I think, you know, we obviously it'll they, they've tried to blame Putin. It was a little bit of Putin's fault, but not really. Um <laughs> <laughs> it's it was it's a lot bigger than just that so you've got putin as a scapegoat um you've you, you'll probably get some more of who you're going to believe you know the the government or your own lying eyes right so you're going to go to the grocery store and your bills gonna be up 20 percent. you're going to be all honked off and they'll tell you no 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 you're wrong it's actually only seven and it's fine and and they'll do that as long as they can because again ultimately mm-hmm. it's about that nominal gdp relative to the interest rate and and that that, that the government's paying to get that debt to gdp number down so mm-hmm. it'll probably be a combination of blame russia blame blame you know understate the numbers um hope for the best you know it, it, it's it's going to be challenging though because the number the discrepancies are going to have to be so big now because they, you know, they could have done it. This should have done this 10 years ago, 12 years ago. They didn't. It's yeah. the, this, this dogmatic religion about preserving the real value of the bond market. And now the numbers are just so big. You're going to have to run negative real rates, 10% plus for three, four, five years to get that, to get to the debt, to GDP to a sustainable level from which you can normalize policy. Well, so do you see this playing out basically as a major capitulation event and we we have a true bottom, not the one we saw back in June, and then the money printer goes burr again and suddenly we see equities rallying again, you know, some of the gro- the growth stocks, not just commodities rallying and uh, and Bitcoin potentially going back. I mean, how do you actually see this playing out? The way, and this is, I'll, I'll put an asterisk here that I'm, I'm free to change my mind, right? The, mm-hmm. the Druckenmiller Miller uh, caveat. But the way I think it's going to play out is I think we are going to see the Fed do another 75 basis points uh, this week. I think the market will tremor a little bit on that. I understand we're from an oversold condition right now, whatever. Um, I think our policymakers are wildly under and investors are wildly underestimating uh, how bad what has already happened in Europe is going to impact the economy and then how that is going to ripple through highly levered economies, highly levered markets. And so I think you're going to get uh, I think you're going to get a whoosh down uh, sometime over the next three, four months. uh, And at that whoosh down, and it's not just going to be markets. It's going to be economies whooshing down. And I think you'll see strains that central bankers simply won't be able to uh, ignore, right? Stock market goes down. They don't care. You know, you even saw today, biggest tail on a 10-year treasury auction, three basis points in, in, in you know, uh, biggest tail in, in whatever, 10 years. What happens when that's a five five basis point tail, eight basis point tail, 10, 10 basis point tail? These are the types of things where they'll have to go, okay, and they'll they'll, they'll you know they'll come in with hey it's treasury market functioning it's not QE this is not we're not growing our balance sheet for QE we're growing it for treasury market functioning and you know so don't worry it's not inflationary it's just treasury market functioning and of course it will be inflationary of course it's QE just like it was in 4Q19 when it wasn't QE um yeah and and that so i think we'll, i think it'll almost be like a uh, i think well, how it'll play out will be a version of what we saw in covid on steroids which is whoosh down and then whoosh up but i think on the whoosh up it's going to whoosh for a lot longer because ultimately the bond market at that point will go, wait a second. I, th- I think this is the last iteration where they can trick trick the bond market into believing like this isn't mm. sort of permanent. Um, and so I think it'll be a really interesting time because I think when you say, okay, assets, you said growth stocks, commodities. Yes. And yes, I, for, for, for my entire career, you've had the 60, 40 portfolio, right? Which has been 60% stocks, 40% bonds. And the 40% bonds is always the ballast. And then the 60 switches back and forth, equity value or growth value, growth value, mm-hmm. growth value, growth value. I think this next iteration will be 60% growth, 40% value or vice versa. 
and it'll be the bond market I'm like going, oh my God, this is never stopping. Just get me out of bonds. And so that's why I think the whoosh on the other side or the takeoff on the other side will be uh, epic because that bond market is going to be selling itself to the Fed. I think that will force them into some version of yield curve control, right? Mm -hmm. So it'll be, we're doing treasury functioning management. This is not, you know, um, this is not QE. And then as, as yields keep moving up or testing them, this is, I don't know, uh, yield yield management, but we're not cap, you know, it's not yield curve control. They do not want to say that word mm -hmm. because for them, yield curve control for the Fed in particular is Hotel California. That is the Fed is going to buy every bond out there. Their balance sheet goes 9 trillion, 12 trillion, 20 trillion, 30 trillion pretty quickly. So um, that's that's how I think it's going to play out is I think we're going to get this this risk off driven by what's already happening in Fed tightening, geopolitically, energy problems. And then I think that will show up in currency markets or sovereign debt markets somewhere. Uh, here, Japan, Europe, I don't know. Um, China even maybe, I, I, I don't know. But um, And then once that happens in the West, then I think then it starts to go game on where they have to go in to address these, issue, these issues in sovereign debt markets. And once that happens... Here we go. Yeah, off to the races. Wow. I, I mean, when you say all of this, it's fascinating. And all I'm thinking in the back of my head is Bitcoin, Bitcoin, Bitcoin <laughs> uh, will probably be the beneficiary of that as well. Yes, um, I agree. I want to come back to Bitcoin because I'm kind of curious how you first heard about it. Now, you know, a lot of Bitcoiners are are quoting you. They love following your tweets. But first, um, speaking of China, you tweeted recently um you know, kind of referring to the to the sense that we've sold our our labor class to to China essentially, mm -hmm. kill U.S. labor and you hand the Chinese a massive advantage. Don't kill U.S. labor and you release wage inflation expectations, hammering the bond market. The U.S. must choose between winning the great power competition versus China or maintaining the value of the bond market in real terms. For people who maybe don't have you know an extensive background in bonds finance, can you just explain what this means on sort of a macro picture for the average? working family in America, the middle class that once was so strong here? Yeah. So the, in short, the story for the middle class over a big economic story for the middle class over the last 25 years, really since NAFTA was signed in 94, I think. So gosh, that's going on 28 years, um, has been effectively a case where we are offshoring jobs to lower cost wage areas. And what that ends up doing is depressing wages here. It helps contain inflation here. It lowers costs here. Ultimately, lower inflation, lower wage, that helps the bond market. It hurts the, uh, it hurts the, uh, the American middle and working classes. Uh, the winners in that are the US government because they can borrow more cheaply. Um, they get cheap financing of deficits because then we, we buy stuff from China, mm -hmm. we send dollars, they recycle the dollars into our capital markets, um, and particularly treasury mortgage backed markets. There was sort of this virtuous cycle for a while. The Chinese have all but stopped buying treasuries for most of the past 10 years. So that has kind of stopped. That has turned into the Chinese buying our equities and ports and things around mm -hmm. the world. It's suddenly much less strategically advantageous. We're basically selling control of our companies for plastic widgets at Walmart. Not a good trade in the long run, in the short run, maybe. Um, but we're into the long run part of that movie. So it's there's really been this this deal. This it's that when you talk about uh, the bond, you know, it, basically we the U.S. policy since the Clinton administration has been about subjugating the U.S. middle and working classes to support the bond market. Yep. And that's what this tweet alludes to, which is, look, you can have one or the other. You want to win the great power competition. You, 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 it's inflationary. Like like Zoltan said, war is inflationary. We, you want to reshore? It's inflationary. You've got to buy this stuff. You got to build the infrastructure. The bond market has to suffer on a real basis. That's just how it is. Alternatively, you listen to guys like Larry Summers and 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 Bill Dudley and sort of these guys who are 70, 75 years old, and they came up in the sort of you know bond market uberalis regime from 95 to to recently. 
and they're, hey, raise rates, put the economy in a depression, whatever you got to do, take unemployment to 6%, but you got to you got to get inflation down to save the bond market. Well, that's great. Sure. But again, if you do that, you're, there's not going to be the reindustrialization. There's not going to be the rebuilding of the U.S. that needs to happen to win this great power competition. So you have to choose. And, and we're at that moment of choice. Interestingly, you're seeing signs that the Biden administration has chosen to throw the bond market under the bus, right? When you talk about $50 billion for semiconductors, uh, industrial policy, I mean, that is absolutely incredible. This was inconceivable 10 years ago, five years ago. So you're seeing s- some of these things, but it's almost like uh, the freight that they're trying to ride two horses with one ass. Like they want to, they want to, they want to do industrial policy and reshore stuff, but they want to also maintain the real value of the bond market. And the horses are riding in, you know, the, it's it's like the Jean Claude Van Damme commercial with the with the semis, right? And they're going away, and he's doing yeah. the splits. Like that's the Fed. They like Jean, you know, Powell is Jean Claude Van Damme. So see, see, Powell, I, I I do say some nice things about you every now and then. Well, so I mean, but doesn't this make you think? Like, are we governed and led by people who are just complete idiots who don't understand anything about <laughs> economics and leading us? Um, down this path or by very corrupt people who know exactly what's going on and they're benefiting from it, being close to the monetary spigot and in these positions of, you know, concentrated power. And they're and they're leading us down this evil path. Like, which is it? Like, are they completely I mean, because I've covered I covered a lot of politicians and elections when I was a reporter. And I swear there was no true, um, I think, economic understanding of of capitalism and how markets work and how the 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 bond market functions. Functions and it was truly, you know, where can you place the blame? Hopefully, you could put it on your opponent. You can say that you're going to fix it by promising to sprinkle some money on a problem, and yet the problem keeps ballooning and getting bigger. And what's sad is we do lose that vibrant middle class that I think made America so strong for so long, and now we don't have it anymore. I, I to your question is is which is true? I mean, it, it does it. It reminds me of of you know of, of the Mark Twain quote, right? I, I I sometimes I wonder if if we're being put on by imbeciles, you yes. know, or by by imbeciles or 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 people who really mean it, right? You know, yes. um, And I think the answer is yes. I think it's both, right? I think there are people in the background who absolutely know what they're doing and are acting out of very shrewd self interest. Uh, and the political process in this country is such that it is, um, shall we say, an a, a extreme proof of stake uh, uh, political yeah. system. Um, and then I think our political class, I mean, I had a conversation with somebody, with a Washington veteran, um, I don't know, this is probably four or five months ago. And they'd been are in around Washington most of their lives in one of the uh, senior administration in, in, a, in an economic post. And they said, Luke, you have to understand when I went to Washington 30 years ago, the Congress people still wrote laws. That was 30 years ago. They said, and then that migrated to the staffers writing the laws in the last 20 years. Yeah, And then that migrated to the lobbyists writing the laws for the staffers <laughs> and the laws getting so big that the Congress people, I mean, you know, we, we I mean, was a Pelosi said the one time it was like a thousand page bill. Like we have to pass it to read what's in it. Like what? what? So I think it's just sort of this classic story of humanity. When you look back through these cycles of, of mm-hmm. government and great power and all these sort of foibles of mankind, I think the situation has evolved such that it's almost been like a specialization of labor where the politicians are really good at one thing, which is getting reelected. And that's it. Yeah. You know, to your point. And the staffers are really good at sort of supporting that process, shall we say. Uh, I'll be diplomatic. <laughs> Looking busy. <laughs> yeah. And then the so the people really behind the scenes who know what's going on. Are, are big corporations. Mm-hmm. They're really running the show. And what's in their interest? Big corporations have no moral authority or, or code whatsoever. Their job is make money. They are, they're like Skynet. They're like Terminators, right? Like they don't stop. They don't die. They have no kids. They like, it's, they just keep going. So mm-hmm. there's this, you literally have the money and the brains behind the whole system being functionally indifferent from a sociopath. 
and the sociopaths writing the laws, they have all the money and they're paying them. And these guys are just like, Hey, I just need to get reelected. So sociopath, Mm -hmm. keep giving me more money and I'll do whatever you tell me to do. And that's kind of how you get here. So I, I think that's part of it. Now, the good news is, is ultimately the politicians are very much self-interested. Um, and so when you see something as obvious as COVID, where it's, hey, we need masks, uh, we have to ask China nicely for masks. That was, I think, finally the aha moment, because the U.S. military had been talking about some of the inefficiencies around this whole setup for 10, 15 years. People are like, stop, we've got it. It's OK. Corporate America's like, hey, we're minting money in China. Shut up, military. Don't say anything. And then finally, everyone's like, we need masks. We need PPE. And... They go, well, China's got all that stuff and we can't make it. And so I think finally COVID put it into terms that everybody could easily understand uh, in Washington. And so you've seen, I think, a real tipping point in the last two years of, okay, this whole, you know, let us do whatever we want, offshore jobs, offshore the middle class. It all makes sense as long as the corporations, the mindless sort of entities are making more money. Uh I think you finally saw COVID attach some sense of humanity to it. So we'll, I'm optimistic, but I'm, I'm also aware of how it goes. So we'll see. All right, let's talk about Bitcoin 2023 and Bitcoin Amsterdam. Here's a look at Miami 2022, but Bitcoin Magazine and the team that brought you the world's largest Bitcoin conference is bringing the mission of hyper-Bitcoinization global with the inaugural European gathering this fall. Bitcoin Amsterdam will take place on October 12th through the 14th at a beautiful venue in the heart of the city. Join thousands of Bitcoiners for three days of curated Bitcoin content that is relevant to the emerging Bitcoin scene in Europe and the global movement. Confirmed speakers include Dr. Adam Beck, Alex Gladstein, Greg Foss, Ray Youssef, and many, many more. The European installment of Sound Money Fest will also take place on day three of the event, October 14th, and admission is included with GA and will passes. And after Bitcoin Amsterdam, which I'm so excited to attend, is of course Bitcoin 2023. It's going to be held again in Miami next year, next May, and you can head to b.tc slash conference. Use the code HODL, H-O-D-L, for 10% off your tickets to both BTC 2023 and Bitcoin Amsterdam. I will see you there. And finally, I want to thank my partner, Fold. Fold is the best Bitcoin rewards debit card and shopping app in the world. You can earn Bitcoin on everything you purchase with Fold's Bitcoin cashback debit card and win free Satoshis every day or even a whole Bitcoin by spinning the daily wheel and purchase rewards wheels. Fold app is one of the best ways for someone completely new to Bitcoin to enter the space and start earning and learning. You can head to foldapp.com slash Natalie for 5,000 sats when you sign up. All right, back to the show. What you- so we'll see. Yeah, what you're talking about, it makes me think of, I think it was a Robin Williams quote where he said uh, that politicians should wear jackets like NASCAR, where you see who <laughs> who sponsored, who bought them, you know, you can see who's actually paying for for what they're what they're preaching. Um, but it kind of makes me think too how everybody today looks for a political savior. You know, the right br- blames the left, the left blames the right. If the guy um in, who's blue is in office, all, you know, it's easy to say everything that's going wrong is because of that administration. Then we flip flop to the next one. Can you talk a little bit about how on a macro level this is this is way bigger? And no matter what party goes into power and you know, in the midterms or in 2024, they have to print because ultimately we are too far in debt and we need, like, as you mentioned, the the, the inflation and we're going to continue to debase the currency. So life for the average person isn't going to get easier because the middle class is going to continue to get crushed. Yeah. If if the politicians were honest uh, from either side, I, I don't really, I, I actually abhor politics because I agree with you. I don't know that it matters that much one way or another. There's sort of two wings of the same bird, in my view. Um, yeah. And it's all human nature. So I don't necessarily blame them either. Right. Mm-hmm. We, we get what we, we get what we vote for. Uh, but if they were, if they were really honest about the situation, the platform would be, okay, listen, we've hit a critical point. One of three things needs to happen. Either we need to come up with a Manhattan like a Manhattan project like reinvestment in America in technology infrastructure, something that is really going to bolster our productivity, yes. uh, right? Because that can help you earn your way out of you know to delever through mm-hmm. faster real growth. So okay, we need to do that. But again, 
that then will run a, a, a foul of of the Larry Summers and the Bill Dudleys of the world because that's going to take inflation up and it's going to require the Fed to monetize the debt and bondholders are going to get screwed. And you know what? The bondholders have had a great 40 years. They should get screwed, but separate discussion. Um, option number two is you restructure um, the promises, right? You, our, our, if we don't do that, America, then our next option is 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 baby boomers. We're sorry. You need to cut 20, 30, 40 percent Social Security. Now, the reality is, is you could probably do some means testing, things like that, and, and make some real progress. But even then, it's probably still not enough. And that's there's a reason why that's been called a political third wire, um, mm -hmm. you know, third rail. You can't really touch it. And if you couldn't touch it before, you really can't touch it now with the way they handle the 08 bailouts is now you don't want to be that politician saying, hey, mom and pop, you got to cut your, your, your you know, you got to cut your entitlements because we need the money after we bailed out Wall Street the way we did. So we sort of took that away. But that's that's another way you could do it. Um, and uh, hold on. So one, two. And I guess the third way is really just 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 printing the money. Right. It's just flat out we're going to cap rates and inflation is going to go to the moon. So it's really, it's productivity, mm -hmm. it's restructure or it's, or it's print the money. It's, it's going to basically yield curve control or we're going to see inflation run 15 to 20% for five years. And then we're going to normalize rates and, and, and that's going to be the new normal. But those, if they were, if they were honest, that's what they would tell you the options are. And of course, like, nobody can get elected on that you'd you'd, yeah. you'd get one speech and they you'd get thrown out and that would be that but that that's the reality of it. all right well that's interesting well, you you might have my vote but we we'll, we'll, might have to work on it a little bit okay before we circle back to to bitcoin because i do want to ask you i just want to go in depth a little bit more on the energy crisis because i know you tweet about that a lot people are watching europe very closely and you mentioned i think in a podcast that um there's this consensus that we're on the brink of catastrophe that this winter people are literally going to be freezing and starving but Really, when we look back and people are predicting catastrophes, it's never as bad, never turns out as bad as people forecast. So can you talk a little bit about what you see happening, how you see it really playing out? Um, and I'll read one last tweet that you wrote because I thought it was interesting. Sentiment that the worst of the EU energy crisis has passed because EU gas prices didn't set a new high post Russian shutoff reminds me of the sentiment expressed at the time that the worst of the mortgage crisis had passed once Bear Stearns was bought out at $2 a share in March 2008. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, for me, it's really about um, there is at the moment a hyper focus on gas supplies in and out of Europe. Are they going to run out of gas? And I understand why that's the case. And I, it's important to understand. And if that was my job, um, that's that's exactly what I'd be focused on. There is right now not a lot of analysis being done um around the second derivatives. And what I mean by that is, as you read a lot of these analyses, even the European politicians, we're going to ration demand. Price will ration demand. True, I agree. Then what, right? So yes, will will price ration demand? I have no doubt that it will. No one's figuring, no one's, no one's looking into what price that is, and, and even the ones they are. No one's looking at the price needed to ration demand, what that's going to do to... I don't know, house payments, pub payments, credit card payments, just, you know, when you take the discretionary, you're, you're, you're going to be whacking off a chunk of discretionary budget for an entire economy that is, oh, by the way, highly indebted. Um, and so once that just this this chain of dominoes gets going, there's no analysis uh, really that people are. And, and it's a very hard analysis to do. It's not like you can you know, in, in Wall Street, people like to put really hard numbers, right? GDP is 3.2%, which is laughable. Right? How do you calculate a $20 trillion economy 0.2%? It's a joke. Same thing here is that Wall Street likes these precise numbers. There's no way to put a precise number on this. It's, we we can, we know there's connections. We don't know how big they are. We don't know how the leverage is. Here's what we do know. You've got uh, utility companies being told that they might have a trillion and a half margin calls coming. Trillion and a half. That's big enough all by itself. Lehman's balance sheet was 800 billion, you know, 10, 15 years ago. So we don't know where the leverage is. We know there is a lot of it. We know it's systemic in nature. And so that's why I say when I see people say, okay, gas prices didn't go up after the Russians cut off. So that's the worst of it. Maybe, 
Um, I don't think so. I think it's, you know, back in 08, when Lehman went under or was bought out at two bucks, there were people saying, well, that's it. Somebody has failed in the prior crises, right? And so that's, you know, that's the long-term capital in 98. And that was the bottom of that crisis. And, and the Russian, you know, Russian debt default, that was the bottom of that crisis. And it wasn't the bottom of the crisis because it was so much more systemic. So I think, I think, I think that Europe will, will probably have be, be, be just fine in terms, I mean, by definition, they won't run out of gas because price will go where it needs to be. To me, the real interesting question is, is what's the economy look like at the price needed to ration gas? And what do sovereign debt markets, what do corporate debt markets, what do the bank credit, what does bank credit in Europe look like? We know that if European banks have problems, they'll, they will spread. Just there's connections globally. So I don't, that to me is really the more interesting question. And I think the more pressing issue, and I think it's going to be the thing that really surprises policymakers uh, and analysts is this is not a case of, hey, take energy prices up 20 percent and take GDP down five. You know, this is, you know, take energy prices up 20 and you're going to have assets potentially collapsing in, 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 in certain markets. We just don't know where that is um, or collapse or currencies collapsing. Right. Because what are we right. seeing? We're seeing them come out and say, well, we're just going to print the money. We're just going to hand you the money for the difference. Well, yeah. OK, the, maybe the economy won't collapse nominally, so the debt will be OK, but the currency is going to be the release valve. And that then circles back into balance of payments. They have long dollar assets. They'll sell dollar assets to defend their currencies. You get into very much a number of different potential uh, spirals that can that can move off of the statement, the comforting statement of, well, price will just ration demand. Yes, it will. Mm -hmm. And then what? It's so interesting learning about this because I'm from Europe and, you know, I, I like listening to people like you and James Lavish and some of the other analysts talking about the anti-fragmentation and the, the, this whole strategy, because my family would talk about how, you know, you would try, they would travel and do business, conduct business across the different countries and everyone had a different currency, right? You need the lira and the pound here and the franc here. And now it seems like this big experiment has not worked out very well at all. Um, okay. I want to hear about your Bitcoin journey. How did you hear about Bitcoin? And, you know, with the price falling as much as it has, what are your thoughts on it in terms of the next couple of years? Are you bullish on Bitcoin? Short answer is yes. I'm very bullish on Bitcoin over the next couple of years. Um, my journey is probably, I suspect I'm, I'm, I have a lot of companies. It's one of my biggest regrets, right? Because it's after 08, it was clear to me they're going to have to print a lot of money. Uh, when they first did the first big QE, I went and I bought but in, in March of 09, uh, they print money, they buy treasuries. I probably did like a lot of people. I went and I bought a book about Weimar Germany, right? And I read the book yeah. about Weimar Germany quickly and I go, okay, there's some things that are similar, but there's a lot of things that are different and, and the politics are different and, and, and. So, but at the end of the day, it's going to be inflationary. So, okay. So I buy stocks, I buy gold, I bought a lot of gold, a lot of stocks. Um, and it worked out great. Um, and I started hearing about Bitcoin it was probably 2011 or 12, maybe. And now oh, at wow. This point, oh, yeah. I mean, it, the only way I did is because, again, the circles I was running in, I knew some guys that um, had done very well in the mortgage crisis, and they were working on this new thing called Bitcoin. They were really interested in it. And I, I met with them a couple of times. And like, this isn't like, oh, I could have bought a bunch of Bitcoin in 2011 or 12, because back then, I mean, they were they were like, like going down and buying the thing, buying it off of like, like, like video gamers in Argentina and stuff, right? Like this was like a really, <laughs> yeah. this was like the wild, very West. early. Yeah. Very early. And then you started seeing it on zero hedge every now and then, like it hit a dollar, it hit $10, it hit a hundred dollars. Right. And you kind of go, Oh, and I looked back and I go, the ironically, it was like the government will never let it work. Um, and so I didn't buy anything. The first time I bought it was, I find that these 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 guys. I, I finally said, okay, how do I buy it? And they they said this Coinbase had just come up. This is 2013 now, right? So this I think Coinbase launched what like second quarter, third quarter, 2013, something like that. Mm -hmm. So I bought my first Bitcoin in the I don't know third quarter of 2013, fourth quarter of 2013. For how much? Uh, I want to say. 700 or 800 bucks something like that wow. something wow. like that and you know it was 
it was like a speculation. It's like, oh, okay, right. But I look back now and I go, you know, I wish I'd have, I wish I'd have spent just a little bit more time studying it. Yeah. Um, I sold most of it, quite honestly, the next year as part of uh, the startup capital for FFTT. So I always kept a few oh. around just to kind of, you know, when you own a couple of something, you know, or a little bit of something, you keep an eye on it versus maybe you wouldn't. And then I wake up in 2017 and it's worth like a bunch of money <laughs> right yeah. in the first sort of run up. And that was, that was probably very, that was not probably, it was, it was very mentally challenging for me because I own this gold. And if I would have allocated just slightly differently gold versus Bitcoin, like you, it's not hard to do the math. You just like, right. Like the, the opportunity cost was, was very much a um, mm -hmm. mentally challenging. Um, cough, Peter Schiff, cough. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it, you know, but it was, and so at any rate, um, the really where I really started to understand it was I was just doing macro, just doing macro, just doing macro. And the Bitcoin people started reaching out to me. The Bitcoin community started reaching out to me. Hey, you want to come on my Bitcoin podcast? Yeah. I think, you know, I would, Peter McCormick, I think it was one of the first ones to reach out. And I did that. Preston Pish was, mm -hmm. uh, and I don't remember the order. Uh, those two gentlemen in particular were the two first Bitcoin uh, focused podcasts that reached out to me. And the more I talked to them, you know, it was almost like learning by osmosis from them. They'd ask uh -huh. questions and we talk and then we talk offline. And the more, and finally I just started buying a little bit more. So at any rate, uh -huh. my understanding of it has come to, to really be, it's, it's a neutral reserve asset for the people. It's effectively a energy tied neutral reserve asset. Um, it, it is, it is a digital gold is how I think of it. And there's a lot of, it's a very simplistic way of understanding it relative to, I'm sure yourself and lots of other Bitcoin community people. But for me, that's, that's how I look at it as I I've seen it described as a battery, which is, I think is a very elegant way of, of thinking about it by a corporation in Norway or something, I think described it that way and went into a bunch of detail that made sense, but that's, that was my journey, which was from, I can't believe the government's going to let this go on to, okay, I'll buy some, um, you know, from a curiosity to that, to buying some, and then watching it do nothing for five years. And then like having Coinbase and going, oh my God, like these few Bitcoin yeah. I left around are like worth a good chunk of money now. Like, oh, interesting. And then watching it crash and being like, okay, it was a bubble, you know, just like we talked about at the beginning. And so it's okay, it crashed bubble. Oh, well. And then it came back and like yeah. bubbles don't do that there. That's a little different. That's, you know, the other bubbles have taken a lot longer to do that or have never done that. So it's, 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 it's been a, an interesting, an interesting journey. Yeah, no, it's really interesting hearing people's journeys because so many of us are the same. It's like, you're curious, but you're highly skeptical. You think it could go to zero, but then you see its price performance and what it's doing. And then you question it a little bit more, but it does take a lot of uh, work to educate yourself. And there's so much nuance. You have to really understand different economic theories and how the technology is programmed. Um, so based on your current understanding of Bitcoin, do you still think that there is a, a threat from governments that could at least impact it maybe in the short term? I think that's always a risk, not so much of it being broken but i think as an as a as an investor you need to be cognizant of the times in which we are living uh and by that i mean if you'd have said five years ago 10 years ago 20 any time before january of this year if you would have said the canadians are going to do what they did in terms of cracking down on that protest Truckers, yeah um I would have laughed. I would have. And I think most people would like the like the Canadians, are like the nicest people in the world. And they still are. But they're, they're, that their government did that, I think, to me, was, you know, something my wife always says to me is when people show you who they are, believe them. And Amen. I think when you see that from that particular government and when you see the times we are in and you see that we're in sort of this global competition, the geopolitical tensions, which tend to give governments the ability uh, to be more aggressive. Long, 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 long uh, build up to, I think as an investor, you need to be prepared for the possibility that they can close the on and off ramps for a period of time, for an undisclosed period of time, right? I mean, it was illegal to own gold in America from 1933 to 1974. Do I, is that my base case? Absolutely not. 
but it happened in the United States of America. Would that apply to Bitcoin? No, because obviously, you, you know, your keys, you, you, you know, cold storage, like, but it would be really, really difficult to, you know, you, you, you'd have to go to another country. You'd have to sort of, you know, go through the whole, the whole, the whole shooting match. And even then, as an American, there might be, you know, you couldn't just sort of, you know, get it out of cold storage and put it in a bank there. Because if it's still tied to the dollar system, they're not going to want to touch you as an American. You see that in Switzerland sometimes with some of the uh, the anti, you know, the whatever, you know, the CATSA or whatever, right? The mm -hmm. anti-money laundering stuff. So um, long preamble to, I think you need to reflect that tail risk into your weightings, right? So you don't, you know, for me having... 80, 90, 100% of your net worth in Bitcoin, okay. But I think given where we are in this reality, there is a non-zero possibility that the authorities just, they can't break Bitcoin, but they can shut off the on and off ramps for an American for an extended period of time. And then you're sort of stuck. So, you know, un un until you can, you know, get that, uh, get those on and off ramps or go somewhere where you can start circumvent those. So, that's the type of thing you have to be worried about, but I don't think that they can. I don't think that they can break it. And the Chinese government's tried to break it. And if the Chinese can't, I, you know, I don't. I, I'd like to think the American government's never going to get that draconian. Well, that's really interesting that you say that because there are a lot of folks out there, including my viewers and listeners, who are so long Bitcoin that they are. 80 to 90 to 100 percent of their net worth in this and they believe it's sort of a zero sum game and i'm just kind of curious your thoughts my last sort of bitcoin question to you is um you know there's a lot of game theory that's playing into this that we're seeing with russia and with china cbdc's are going to be emerging more and more but at the end of the day if bitcoin does survive it does threaten the dollar. I mean, because why would you need the dollar if you have lightning as a payment rail? And this is, you know, there's no there's no third party that you need to trust. It's this beautiful system based purely on technology that no one can control, no one can manipulate. So, I mean, is it a zero sum game or do you see more of a world where uh, it's different kind of reserve assets, like you mentioned, maybe the dollar is the main currency, but then also you have the BRICS countries that have their currencies. Like, how does this play out with Bitcoin? Or do you even think about this? No, I do. And it, it the game theory is very fascinating because you're right. Like, I remember having a, a conversation with a venture capitalist out on the West Coast. This had been probably five years ago now. And they said something interesting to me, which is that the the, the the, the the tech guys have the scalps of all the industries that they've killed or completely disintermediated right uh. on their walls and the one that they have the, the great white whale they haven't been able to get has been banking mm. and and control of banking and money is intricately tied with power with political power uh and so you can see anything you can see why yeah it would be it would be a threat uh and in particular and i think this is something that helped me understand bitcoin once you know a, a, enough of the, the of the bitcoin community graciously was like like i'm, I'm a little thick i'm german by descent right so I'm, I'm a little i'm a little stubborn at times so <laughs> but once you understand how they've controlled gold when you then apply that and realize that it's very difficult to use the same methods that they've controlled gold, which is the unmitigated expansion of paper derivatives mm -hmm. and how Bitcoin is very resistant to that. Mm -hmm. It hits you like a ton of bricks. You're like, Oh my God. And once that hits you, then it's like, okay. And that's part of why I've, I've coined this phrase or I've used this phrase I, I, of, of Bitcoin's the last functioning smoke detector it, that they, that they haven't been able to disable, right. That it's, it's not a bubble. It's, 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 it's the not bubble. It's telling you what's happening. It's been a very good indicator of liquidity uh, up and down. And so I think it's a threat. I don't know that it necessarily needs to replace the dollar. I don't think that it will because I think the dollar I think of it'll it would it has more of I mean you can pay in Bitcoin but it's one of those things like well, you know once you have the payment rails but why would you that, that that doesn't make sense I mean you can but that's like paying in you know fractionalizing 
you know, beachfront real estate in San Diego. Like, why would you do that? You pay, you know, it's Grisham's Law 101. You pay with the bad currency and you hold mm-hmm. the good currency, right? So mm-hmm. um, I think of it as almost like digital beachfront real estate where it'll, it, it, I think it, it threatens more the treasury market. Mm-hmm. Yes. But the treasury market's already under threat. Like it's already foreigners aren't buying enough. Foreign central banks stopped buying treasuries eight years ago. So, mm-hmm. you know, some of the guys that have done, um, I, his name's escaping me right now, Jason. Um, uh, Jason Lowry. Yes, has done uh, excellent, really interesting work around uh, how Bitcoin can be a sovereign asset how it, of, of the United States, how it can be, um, it could really be a huge positive asset for the u.s if you're forward thinking uh yeah. like jason is and and if, if people haven't seen his work i'd encourage them to sort of you know chase that down in the on the interweb so to speak yeah. but um I, I i think ultimately the powers that be associated with the sort of uh the financial side of u.s power elites policymakers absolutely i think see it as a threat it doesn't have to be. It depends mm-hmm. how we could use. It. I mean, if we came out and said, "All right, Russia and China, you want to stockpile gold? We're going to settle trade in Bitcoin." Like, boom. Yeah. Now what? And yeah, yes, it totally blows up the bond market on one front, right? That's going to happen anyway. It's going to happen anyway. It has to for all the reasons we talked about before. But it seizes the initiative in such a unique non-linear way for America, we would we would have an economic boom like we haven't had since the aftermath yeah. of World War II. It'd be really something. So it's it is a game theory. I look at it, I play there's 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 what I would like to happen and there's what's more likely to happen. Um ultimately I I, I it's I it's one of my core holdings. Um I don't know, you know, I own enough where it it makes a difference. Um you know it's probably it's probably 10% of my liquid net worth, something like oh, that, yeah. um, in terms of holdings, uh, because are you buying all the way up. Or are you, are you among us who bought in the 40, 50, <laughs> 60 range? <laughs> I, I, the short answer is yes. I actually <laughs> sold most of, most of mine last summer. Oh, um, and I just paid down debt. When we go back to that, the, the senses of, of, um, uh, of when we talked about the bubbles, right. Of just mm-hmm. that feeling. So June of June of 2021, I wrote to my clients. I said, listen, I I'm selling most of my Bitcoin uh, and it's I love it, but it's I'm looking at it. It's frothy. I'm going to pay down debt and then I'm going to buy it back. And Um... I would love to say, oh, I bought it all back cheap. I didn't. I bought it. I sold it, paid down debt and then started buying it back 40, 50, 60, (laughs) bought, bought some more. So I'm probably. I had like a little because I, I, I have definitely yeah. added on, on in the, in the twenties range, um, yeah. actually quite a bit. So, um, oh. I, but I still really like it. Oh, so interesting. Yeah. We're all in this together and going back to what you mentioned about, um, you know, the banks, it's like the bankers are the puppet masters of the politicians and that game theory that's going to play out. It's like the banks stand to actually make a lot of money on this, but at the same time, it's sort of threatens them. So it's, I don't know, it's going to be really interesting that that tug of war that's going to happen over the next couple of years is that what's your biggest question about Bitcoin? Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't know that I really have, like, I, I, it's weird to say, cause I, I, I don't want it to sound like I know everything about it. Cause I know like, like, a tiny little bit. So it's not that I know so much that I don't have any. I think it's in terms of just my understanding is on the areas that with how I see it and how I use it personally mm-hmm. are so simplistic. I just think it is digital beachfront real estate, you yeah. know, um, without the risk of hurricanes and climate change and whatever <laughs> else that might, and without an insurance payment that goes up every year. And, and, you know, basically I see it as digital gold. And so I, 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 I I continue to learn more and more. Um, I guess if you say, okay, what's the biggest risk or the biggest question is, and it's not about Bitcoin, it's about the politicians. What are they doing with this whole climate change thing that just came out? What's really the right. goal here? You know, what are, you know, I'd like to think that this is because 
you can see there's ways that Bitcoin be, can be used to optimize the grid, to optimize yes. energy production. Uh -huh. uh, and I get that. that, And that makes a lot of sense to me and make a lot of sense to you. And unfortunately, we're not running the government. Um, they're, you know, they're, you know, flying the sound of, you know, squawk, 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 climate change. Look at all the electricity it's using. And are they going to do something dumb? Um, again, I don't think they can break it, but that's that to me is the types of questions more I have, which right. is more just like, are they going to do something dumb that just creates volatility or, or confusion, et cetera, uh, relative to relative to Bitcoin, not so much that, that, that they're going to break it. That's, that's, I guess, something that's popped in my head recently or that I've read. No, I, I completely agree. And it's interesting to see with the energy crisis, how much the short-sighted policies have, have just hurt, you know, all the countries in the West and everyone that's, pounding on the table saying it has to be solar and wind when it's not reliable and it's expensive <laughs> and only 3% of the world's energy is is solar and wind. So uh, we'll see how that plays out. Hopefully more nuclear as well. And all of that, I think will benefit Bitcoin in the long run. But um, to start to wrap up, I know, I know you're probably um, short on time. I'm just always curious about people's sort of like relationship with money. Cause I know for me coming from an immigrant background, my family lost everything in the financial crisis. My, my relationship with money has always been really interesting. And I think I was primed for something like Bitcoin because I do believe in a, a system that's a little bit more uh, based on merit and where there is more economic opportunity for everyone, as opposed to what I see in the current system, which is, you know, the the wealth concentration as the result of basically very few people having access to, to the money at the expense of everybody else. Um, so it's just kind of curious with your background. I don't know if you want to share anything else um, or just how, how you view you view money. Yeah, I, th I think for me, the 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 real shift in my view on money having the background that I did was in 2008 where and and I was very fortunate from the standpoint because by virtue of what we were doing at at Cleveland Research Company um the research we were doing I I called my dad in October of 07 and I said, the system's going to collapse. So this is a full year before Lehman. It was crystal clear to me at that point that the system was going to collapse. And it was, it was, it was a few data points. It was, it was, you know, um, my, we, we, we went to lunch with a, uh, a, a commercial banker who was pretty high up in a major, you know, mid-major regional bank. Mm -hmm. And we're just eating. And he's like, yeah, I got to tell you, I think, I think our commercial loan book might be 35% overvalued. And I'm like, I was like, say what? <laughs> like I almost had like, I almost had food come out of my nose. I couldn't get, like, I couldn't believe it. And then like a, a week later, we have a, uh, um, we were talking to uh, bad debt collectors, right? So bad debt collectors, it's a private business. A lot of them tend to be attorneys. That whole game at the time was, you buy the bad debt for pennies on the dollars to charge off credit card debt, right? And then you call up uh, the uh, the people who owe the money and you get them to take out a second on their house mm -hmm. and you, you, you get them to pay off their debt for, you know, you buy it for a nickel on the dollar and you get them to pay it off for 15 cents on the dollar and you triple your money real fast yeah. and they lower their, their, their bills, blah, 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 blah. Well, just that debt would be priced like an option. Uh, just is how that industry works. So the price of that debt would fall one to two percent a month, and then summer of 07, five percent it falls, ten percent it falls, twenty percent. It's just falling out of bed. And what happened? We talk. We 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 we're, we're talking to these people, and we go. We call them to the, the collectors, and we go, "What's happening?" I said, "The the the, uh, the secondary mortgage market shut down. Home equity lines have shut down. But that's not good." And then finally, we were talking to somebody at a different regional bank. They're having drinks with them the one night. He's like, yeah, Goldman just called us today. They said they don't want to buy any more of our subprime mortgage production. And we all go like, uh-oh, like it's on. So October was seven. I went to 100% cash in all my in all my um, assets. Uh, I called my dad and my, I, I, I called wow. my father. -in -law. I'm like, listen, how much money do you have in the bank, you know, dad, because you need to make sure you're on Cause at that point in time, the hundred thousand dollars was the deposit limit, right. right. Um, where you weren't insured anymore. I said, do you have over a hundred thousand in any single bank? He goes, no. I said, okay, good. Then you're fine. I said, because I think there's me banks that fail in all of this. This is a year early. That's, that's how good the research we wow. were doing at that place. So wow. 
for me, you saw the Fiat Ponzi starting to unravel I and then they just it blew it back it. up. And now we're seeing it again. We're going to see it again. We're seeing. Yeah. So for me, that was really a huge thing for me watching how the sausage was made and seeing, you know, I think John Stewart said is I thought we had this really strong system. It turns out it was made with balsa wooden baby tears. And, <laughs> and so for me, that was really eye opening, right? Where all of a sudden it's like, okay, I never owned an ounce of gold until after row eight, right? And then I was buying a lot. I bought most of my gold between 700 and a thousand, right? As it just was after row eight, it was like, holy cow, wow. that wasn't supposed to be able to happen. Um, and like you said, now they've just kicked it upstairs. Um, the bubbles in fiat currency itself, the bubbles in sovereign debt itself. Um, you know, so for me, it's this management process of, you need to own the right fiat currency, but you don't want too much of it. You need to own, you know, I mean, it's, it's interesting. This is one of the, one of the wisest, smartest guys who's been at this 60 years said to me, go this, what we've, what we've gone through in 2022 is a true bear market. Cash has gotten killed. You've lost 15% of your money in cash over the last 12 to 14 months. Bonds have gotten killed. Stocks have gotten killed. Tech's gotten killed. Energy's now way off the highs. Gold's gotten hit. Every, there, there is nowhere to hide. Like so, I don't. Know, all of this has been one fascinating. Um, it started really in a way, and it's continuing uh, it, this education in real time. Um, you know, I'm just uh, excited to learn and share what I learn with people yeah. to the extent I can. To the extent I can. Well, we're grateful that you do. Um, to close this out, what do you want people to know who are wondering, like, what do right now? Apparently, we're waiting for a massive capitulation event before they rev up the money printers again. But really, I, like, what what do you want the average person to know as as a kind of a takeaway for what they can do in their lives? And maybe if you can also offer a lot of people learn from you. Who do you learn from? Who do you listen to? God, I learn from a lot of people. Um, I learn from I learn from Grant Williams, Preston Pish. Um, I, I learn from. I mean. My biggest thing, it, it would be shorter to list who I don't learn from okay. because for me, and this is just how my brain works. I don't start with who's saying it. I start with what they're saying. And so people I disagree with vehemently, I don't go to them and I don't think about what they say. I, I think about what they say. I don't really care who they are, who they say. There's something there that I can learn from sure. one way or another. And so I, I just am, I learn from a lot of people <laughs> I, and I try to learn from everybody. Um, what would the average person, what would I encourage them to do? I would encourage them to be diversified and I would encourage them to keep leverage low uh, because we, we collectively, we've never seen anything like this before. Um, and so there's a lot of different ways this could all go. Um, but, but if you are diversified and you keep your leverage low, you don't have to be faster than the bear. You just have to be faster than the slowest camper. And by virtue of the equity bubble, getting kicked up to the housing bubble, getting kicked up to the sovereign debt bubble, the governments are, are, really slow campers so and they're they're really fat campers too so the bears <laughs> the bears gonna get them first you just got to keep yourself less levered than that so i i that's what i would say for the average person is look you know don't get extreme with any one allocation you, you know be cognizant to all the possibilities and all the pathways right i mean the fed could come out tomorrow and be like you know what oops something blew up we've got to start and okay cash is going to be trash bitcoin's probably going to the moon gold's going to do well stocks up or there's a geopolitical angle of this where this could be like the final scene of the movie platoon where the fed is calling in an airstrike and they're just going to go we're going to take the dollar up. we're going to take the dollar up until oil falls because we want to beat Putin. And if that means bonds die and stocks die and Bitcoin dies and gold dies and everything goes towards zero, like that's a possible option too. And I don't think it's a likelihood, but the the tails are very wide and very fat in what we're seeing. And so look, you want to have some cash so that you're liquid in case they do that. They can't do that for very long, but if you're highly levered and very concentrated, you're not going to be solvent enough to live to the other side, right? So it's again, being faster than that fat than the, than the than the slower campers and diversified um 
And I think ultimately it ends with a lot of inflation. But again, we could see severe deflation first for probably a compressed period of time. And so you want to be uh, under levered relative to uh, most other people, in my view. Wow. What a takeaway. Luke, thank you so much. You are so fascinating to talk to. I really hope I get thank to you. have you on my show again. Sorry if we went a little long, but okay. thank you so much. How can people find you? Absolutely. Uh, the On our website, fftt-llc.com. And then on Twitter, as, as people probably know, I'm a fairly active feed. It's at Luke Groman, L-U-K-E-G-R-O-M-E-N. A very popular one. By the way, why'd you name it Forest for the Trees? You know, it was, um, I think, it's really just about having that big picture, right? So the, it, it, out of the phrase, it, it. they're not seeing the forest for the trees. So, mm -hmm. uh, or you miss, don't, don't miss the forest for the trees. So that was the genesis of it. So uh, it. thank you very much. Well, you help us see through all the trees. So thank you so <laughs> much, Luke. Oh, thanks for having me on. It was great talking with you, Natalie. Thank you so much for checking out this episode. I would love to hear from you. If you have any guest suggestions or feedback, make sure again that you're subscribed to this page and like the video so other people see it and you don't miss out on any new content. Until next time.